uh, and I just remember being in a changing room and it, it's a strange moment seeing your teammates but a bunch of 30 odd year old blokes brought to tears in a changing rooms. Hiya, my name is James Clare and this is my rugby league career so far. So my first stint, obviously, as a professional rugby league player. Now, just winding back just before I signed my first ever professional contract, I played in the academy at Casford Tigers while working full-time. I had a few various other jobs outside rugby league and just training on an evening. And it was Steve Gill uh, was the head of youth at the time at Casford, and he offered me my first ever full-time contract at the end of 2011 with the opportunity to become a full-time rugby league player and if you ask any boy, I'm pretty sure from the Castleford area, uh, what do you want to be when you're older? There's a good 95% of them are going to say they want to play for Castleford Tigers when they get older. So uh, me being a season ticket holder from being a young lad, that's that's kind of the dream that you wanted to do. And it, I don't know if it were ever well, an achievable dream what you thought when you were a kid, but uh, to actually get that offer from Steve Gill at the time, uh, there's this wave of emotion over you and I didn't even care what the money was. I didn't even care whether it was a one-year deal or a two-year deal. I was going to sign that paper no matter what, basically. So I think I was a little bit naive to it all. You kind of think, I'm, I'm in, I'm full-time and that's it. I've made it. I don't have to do anything anymore now. And you, you take your foot off the gas a little bit. But um, very thankful to Ian Millward who eventually gave me an opportunity uh, against Huddersfield away now. Cast as a team, we weren't going exactly the greatest. I think we ended up losing about 50 odd points uh, to something in that game. And I, I was on the wing, and um, is it, I've forgotten the winger's name, for just, is it Luke George? He scored about four or five tries that game against me. So, probably one of the worst games I've ever played in terms of performance. But again, it was just a surreal moment just to step on the field, have your name on the back of your shirt and memories that I'll cherish absolutely forever. One that always sticks in my head in 2012 was we actually played Huddersfield again later on in the year, but this time it was the home fixture rather than the away fixture, the, the debut game. And uh, we ended up beating Huddersfield 50 odd points. It was kind of like the flip result. They beat us by 50 the first game and we beat them by 50 in the second game. And I actually scored my first ever try, my first Super League try, my first try at home as well. And it's a memorable one for me. I remember Richie Owen passed me the ball and a little bit of a set play and the try line was clear as day. I just had to walk in and put the ball down, but I ended up falling over twice, doing a little bit of a pirouette and making it far more difficult than it really should have been. But still a memorable moment for me that will always stick with me. Obviously, Danny Orr became the interim head coach when Ian Millward parted ways and he gave me an opportunity very quickly and I felt like I played well at the time. Uh, I played a couple of games under Danny. I think he coached about four or five games before Pauli officially took the job. Um, and then once Pauli were back on board, it was just about learning what he wants his outside backs to do and just taking everything on board because it is a phenomenal coach. I mean, it, he's absolutely incredible at the ways that he gets the best out of his players. Uh, he's always driving for improvement, so I was just happy to be learning from one a player that I used to watch when I was a young kid anyway, one of the toughest players I've ever seen in my entire life, but then to get him to coach me as well was just a special moment, so listening to everything I could possibly listen from him and just bide my time waiting for an opportunity. Uh, and then again, similar to my debut year, I eventually played another game under Paul a little bit later on in the year and it was against Hull FC at home and I'd obviously had the terrible game against Hull FC away against Ian Millward at the beginning of the year. Uh, played Hull FC at home and a nice memorable try that sticks in my memory is a, a little full length from a, a kick. So I went from the kid that couldn't catch a ball and made errors and Hull FC was scoring to uh, late on in the game against Hull FC at home, a kick that I do end up gathering and running the other way to score a full length of the field. So an opposite way, that, that's the way it works. You, if you do get setbacks in life or whether it's in your career on the rugby field, you've just got to kind of forget about it. or Well, not even necessarily forget about it, you've just got to learn from it, kind of forget about the negative emotional side of it, learn from it and then move on to make it a positive one when you get the opportunity later on. Uh, and then I think that season came to an end, we ended up playing Wakefield towards the end of the year, uh, which, I mean, that was my first ever derby game. Uh, and I, I, do you know what, the, the crowd on that particular day, I think it was the very last game of the year we played Wakefield away. Uh, and 
do you know what? We, we played in games where there were four or five thousand fans, maybe six thousand fans, and I, I always thought, God, these are loud crowds, and it's tough to play when there's a bomb up and you're trying to catch it, and you've got opposition fans heckling you. Uh, but that derby game against Wakefield was just something that I've, I've never ever seen before, and uh, we ended up going on to lose the game. I think Liam Kay scored a last-minute winner for Wakefield, but. I mean, it just to, the experience there to see how much the lads raise their game emotionally and physically during it was just a special moment to play in and one that I'll always remember as well. I think 2014, as a younger kid, was probably one of my favourite seasons at CAS. That was almost like a breakthrough year. So rather than just playing one or two games and then missing five or six and waiting for another opportunity. So at the beginning of your career, you're always waiting, whether it's for an injury or uh, a suspension. We had Justin Carney, so he got banned quite a lot at the time. He's cast for the time. So I was probably in for one when he was banned and then I was back out when he was unbanned. Uh, but 2014 was kind of a, my breakthrough year a little bit. That was my first opportunity where I could get into the team and start playing some regular rugby, picking five or six games up in a row at times. And do you know, I, I just absolutely loved it. I learned so much in that particular time because that was the point where you, you weren't fresh and just ready to go. You, you were still a little bit battered from the week before, but you just wanted to do everything for the team. So you got on and you got going. And that's when the team almost, it, they accept you a little bit. Uh, and it, it's not that when, you, when you're training usually at rugby league, it's not that they don't accept you, but when you actually make your break for the team is when you, you feel like you become a part of the team uh, and you're almost accepted. The lads might go for a coffee at the end of training and if you're in there and you're playing and you're regularly, you might get invited to that coffee. And it's only a little thing, but it's a, a special and a nice feeling anyway. Uh, but yeah, that, that year as a whole, I, I absolutely love that year we, we went on. Uh, we had a really good run in the Challenge Cup and everything like that, and it was really special. 2015 came along, and I mean, I don't think that was the greatest year for me personally. I mean, Denny Solomon, we had Denny Solomon, we had Justin Carney, who two were probably the best wingers in Super League in 2015. So, for me, as another outside back winger, I was just finding it difficult to get game time. Obviously, speaking to Pauli, it was a very difficult conversation. I, I remember him saying to me that there's an opportunity to go to Bradford. And I just said to him, I'm not bothered, I'm not going. I don't want to go. I wanted to stay at Cass, fight for your place, like, like any young lad would say. And he, I remember him sitting down, he, he said, all right, don't worry about it. And then he, he rang me about two days later and said he, he wanted to meet me at Costa just for a little bit of a chat about how things are going. And he said, look, I know you don't want to go for Bradford, but I think this would be good for you and your career and your own personal development. Because at, at the moment, you're struggling to obviously get game time, which I agreed with, and I did want to play. He says, Bradford are the top of the championship. They're going to be playing Super League games as we go into the middle eights period, which it was for them. So an opportunity to be playing against Super League competition anyway. And, it, and Pauli were always very supportive of me. He said, go there, go get your game time. If there's any errors in your game, go learn, uh, go express yourself and be the player that you want to be. Uh, and kind of that you're always welcome back at Cask when the time's right. Uh, and knowing Pauli saying that to me and having the big chat with him about it, it's for me and my personal development, it was nothing to do with, I don't know, get, just getting a player out. I wasn't calling kind of any instructions or anything like that. It, it was kind of making the right decision for me. And at the time, probably I didn't understand it, but the big chat with him, and then as you get a little bit older, you do understand it a little bit more. But. I said the opportunity to go to Bradford and the 18 months that I did spend at Bradford the end of the 2015 season and the entirety of the 2016 season were, I mean, they were some of my most special memories as well, just because, like I said, that were an opportunity to go to such a, an iconic club in Bradford Bulls. I mean, again, when I was a kid, even though you're a Castle supporter, Bradford were the team that were just winning everything, they dominated every competition. They had some of the best players that I looked up to in, like Sir Leslie Vinicolo, Shantae and Arpy, so. It was really special to be able to pull that jersey on for a few games. And even though Bradford almost failed in 2016, we didn't achieve the top four middle eights that we wanted to. The kind of tight knit group of lads that we did have, because a lot of the lads in the 2016 season, they'd agreed deals elsewhere and things like that. And they were very open about it. And 
nobody kept any secrets and we all kind of pulled together as a special group knowing people were going to end we wanted to send them off on the best possible way because some of the some of the lads that had been at Bradford had been through multiple administrations to get where to have been through relegations and everything so as much as you owe it to the club and to the fans I mean you make a connection with the players there your teammates and your good friends that you see outside of work you work with them every single day you probably spend more hours and more minutes at work with them than you do your wife and your kids or your partner or even your family you literally see them for so many hours a day so uh, we really did want to pull together and make it a special moment for them but obviously the way things went losing Jimmy Lowe's halfway through and Rowan Smith taking over and everything we just we couldn't get the job done on the field we had a couple of injuries to key players when you, you think Lee Gaskell missed three quarters of the season that year and if you're looking at him now in 2020 at Huddersfield he's for me personally on verge of an England call if he's playing that well at this moment in time so if you'd have had him playing then it would have been a whole different story so but that's one of those things I mean the results needed to be a little bit better on at the beginning of the year we didn't need to be the team that just always thought it would happen but kind of shot ourselves in the foot a little bit but in terms of personal development that was, I felt like that was, like Paulie said he, he he read it like a book. It was the best thing for me. Go to Bradford. Uh, and if there are a few errors in your game, they're not going to be differences between a Super League win and a Super League loss. They were a, a chance for me to learn. I ended up playing wing, centre, fullback. I even had 15 minutes at halfback, which I'm not halfback, but it was nice to have that kind of trust and responsibility and your teammates knowing that you can do the good job for them. Obviously, 2016 ended, but either way, I was still signed to stay at Bradford in 2017 and beyond. <clears throat> I mean, I, I was just absolutely having a, such a brilliant time there. I, I love the culture that Rowan Smith were creating. And even though some of the your good friends were leaving on to other clubs, there was still a core group of players that I thoroughly enjoyed playing with. And I did have the goal and the vision of getting Bradford back to Super League, which would have been extra special being the team that got promoted. Uh, but then administration hits, which in terms of the rugby league, probably the second worst moment in my entire career facing administration because there's that much uncertainty. Uh, my wife had only just passed a degree to be a teacher, so <clears throat> we'd only just bought a house and everything. And I, I know it's a cliche saying you've got a mortgage. I mean, if you lose your job, you're going to go stack shelves at ASDA if you really have to, to pay your mortgage. So it, it's not the complete end of the world, but it's almost like the dreams ended for you personally as a player, which is the scary part because say just before Christmas most teams have got a squad together they don't need any players in outside backs and if they did need players then there's 20 odd players from Bradford all what all speaking to their agent saying can you get me here can you get me there and it's just there's that much uncertainty that you I mean you've set out all these plans to be promoted into Super League in 2017 and then the cap it just gets ripped under your feet and you kind of stood there you didn't get paid for about three or four months back to back and it's, it's difficult, obviously, I had Kimberly who were a teacher and financially she helped support the household and, and things like that. But I mean, there were some lads that they had cars on leases and things like that and lived at home and if they didn't get paid, they literally they were losing cars and everything, which is, I mean, it's really sad times, but you do, you do understand that when a team fails to make the top four, which we did, it, it does have a massive financial impact on the club because of the money that they would have earned from that. I remember somebody saying to me that, yeah, if Bradford had made the top four in 2015, we'd have played Leeds at home, we'd have played um, somebody else at home, two big fixtures which would have been massive income for the club which would have helped financially support them. Um, so it, it's just one of those things, isn't it? Sometimes they work perfectly for you and maybe Bradford have been in Super League in, a, in an alternative universe, but just as it happens, it didn't work and the, the owners obviously chose to do what they do and pull out of the club a little bit and leave everybody in a, in a little bit of a sticky situation but I suppose he, he has to personally do what he needed to do for his own family as much as we're saying we've got our own family he can't be affording to lose millions into a rugby league club as well. We definitely felt guilty because it, I mean as much as the, the club and the coaching staff and the fans give us everything that we had to make a top four uh, middle eight team in the championship we had no excuses we had the quality on the field we had the facilities off the field uh, we'd set the goals, we had the mindset to do it. Uh, I just felt like we left it just probably a little bit too late. I mean, ultimately, the players are the responsibility, aren't they? I mean, you can't take anything away. Even if you have the worst facilities and you have the worst fans in the world, it's the players that perform on the day. You can blame referees or anything you want to do, but they're just excuses 
at the end of the day, it's the player's decision making. It's the way the players play. If they're committed to the goal, then you achieve your goal. It's as simple as that. If if you've got, I mean, obviously the players that are committed, but some players maybe going to another club, like we mentioned earlier, if their head space is just quite quite aren't quite in it, uh, you end up having slightly look last of performances, but. I mean, don't take that away from anybody because the players that were actually signed at other clubs, they were probably the better performers anyway. Uh, so it, it's not like the commitment wasn't there. It was just unlucky. A couple bounces of the ball every now and again and things like that, and they don't always go your way. But, I mean, we can't make excuses. As a, as a playing group, we just weren't good enough at the time. And it's possibly that we, we did have a young team, to be fair, at Bradford. I think, I mean, I were about 25 or 26, and I was maybe the third oldest player on the field. Uh, we had a couple of people like Chev Walker and Adrian Patel, but they were long-term injuries and, and didn't play for a bulk of the season. And yeah, I think even Matty Blythe, he's only a, a year or two older than me. Paul Clough again, but he, he was missing for the majority of the season as well, just from a long-term injury. So missing them senior players does affect you massively. But then going back to the administration, I mean, it, it is a very difficult situation. We're having meetings on meetings with lawyers and things like that about what they could do for us. And, when, when you get into a situation like that, everybody promises you the absolute world. We'll get you all this money owed back. We'll, we'll even get you more than you owed back because of the financial troubles that you've been under. And if you've been charged by anybody or anything, keep records of them and we'll, we'll sort it out. Don't worry. And I mean, I mean, money's always nice and it, it does make the world go round a little bit. But for me, I just wanted to play rugby. I ended up into the Lee Centurions just around Christmas time because the club entered administration officially which meant you could leave as a free agent and Lee Centurions the team that had just been promoted to Super League that year needed an outside back and it's one of those things I didn't want to leave Bradford but you had a piece of paper there that said you, you'll get paid for two years you guarantee this you're going to be back to Super League where I wanted to be anyway uh, obviously, ideally, with, with Bradford Bulls getting them promoted, but I could have skipped a year in a sense, gone straight to the league. Uh, and, and looking at the Lee St. Jones team as well, they, they had some good outside backs, but I felt like they were an opportunity. Obviously, Adam Higson and Matty Dawson were the starting wingers at the time, and both performing extremely well in the championship and both both proved themselves at Super League as well. So it were a thing though I thought I could get in there and give it my best shot and push for a starting spot. I mean, M62 is absolutely awful. It's difficult to travel over there on the best of times. So uh, living in Pontefract, I, I travelled anyway. There were a good group of lads in Ben Crooks, Ryan Amster, Matty Dawson and Liam Mudd. And I think if it wasn't for that tiny group, just the lads, you know, with the music playing in the car and having a joke about every single morning, we're, we're setting off at 5am in the morning is when we'd meet and then drive through to just to avoid the traffic. I mean, some days we wouldn't even start training until 9am, but we, we'd go early and then just sleep in the changing rooms just to avoid that mid-hour rush because rather than an hour and a half car journey, it could be a two, two and a half hours minimum. Uh, and I always remember we'd get in the changing rooms and on these automatic light settings. So we'd lay down and you'd have to lay dead still. And if one person moved, all the lights would come flooding back on again. So. I think there were some memorable things that they had ice baths there, but we obviously empty. We'd be getting in the baths and using your, your things as a pillow and everything. I really enjoyed, obviously, my, the pre season at Lee. I, I was getting, obviously, missing a little bit of training at Bradford due to the administration. You, you go in a little bit unfit and things like that. But I mean, the Lee lads, obviously, on the back of the promotion, there was such a buzz about it. There were people going to be making Super League debuts that never played. There were some Australian internationals in Glen Stewart and people that were just, I mean, I, will, I remember looking around thinking, how am I in a room that Willie Tonga were there, somebody I used to watch in the State of Origin. I was thinking, how, how am I stood in a room or in a team where I could be on the wing one day and he'd be in my centre? It was just, and I, I couldn't understand it. I can't even put it into words now. But then obviously, I, I had the, the world's dreadest, in, oh, the world's worst injury for a rugby league player that everybody dreads in an ACL injury. And, it, it, it doesn't sound like much and to, to the most common people, it, I mean, it, you tear a little ligament in your knee and it doesn't sound that bad at all, but in, it, in terms of pain, honestly, the, the pain wasn't actually that bad, that bad, the surgery wasn't that bad, but the thing that makes it difficult is that you're supposed to wait nine months before you can play rugby league again, just because of this bone healing, it, it's got no blood supply really as the ligament, so it just takes a very, very, very long time to heal. Uh, so I remember doing that against Dewsbury and it, it was in like the 70 odd minute we were going to be playing Castleford uh, away in round one of Super League 
and we played Wigan in a friendly and we played Dewsbury in a friendly and I, I, played, I came off the bench against Wigan and I thought I played quite well for half a game and then started against Dewsbury and played 79 minutes and I, I remember thinking maybe about 60 odd minutes into the game I was thinking I thought I was playing well and in the back of your mind is Castleford round one and I, you kind of you're writing your own story, but by then I've oh, come to Lee. All this stuff's gone up, Bradford. I'm going to play against Cass. Imagine if I score an hat trick against Cass in two weeks' time in round one, and then 70 odd minutes into the game. I mean, nobody even touched me. You're just running a little bit of a slip. Your knee twists just in the wrong way, and it, it's an ACL injury. Uh, which I mean, I, I didn't even know what an ACL injury was until I did it. I remember speaking to Beth Cunliffe, the physio there, or she was the assistant physio underneath Johnny. Uh, and she's pulling your leg about and she, she, you know when you can see a physio's face uh, and she didn't want to say it to me at the time but she pulled it and then I immediately knew something wasn't right just just on her face not from her words uh, but I was just brushing it off and Johnny said don't worry about it like and we'll see you tomorrow uh, just go home rest and then we'll have a proper examination tomorrow because it was a little bit sore and I, he didn't want to be pulling on it too much but I remember saying to Kimberly on my own can we stop uh, you know, just at a service station to buy a razor. Because I thought, if I have to get my knee strapped tomorrow and you've got airy legs as a rugby league player, when you rip that tape off at the end of the day, I mean, it absolutely kills your legs. So I remember joking about saying, let's just go get a razor on the way home. So they're going to strap my knee tomorrow for training and I'm going to have to rip it off and it's going to hurt my leg air. So I'm just planning that, oh, don't worry, it's probably just a bad one, but I'll get it strapped up, I'll be absolutely fine. I wanted to play against Castleford in a, in a week or so's time. And then going in the next day, I remember Johnny saying to me that obviously it's an ACL injury. It's going to be nine months before you're allowed to play again. We've got you booked in for surgery in a week and a half's time. And, it, you know, I tried to take it obviously the best you can, but I mean, it, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And the, there's no way to explain it then other... Just, just imagine your you dream that you've got that's just taken away from you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do by it at all. And it, in terms, I mean... I don't think I was ever depressed as a person or anything like that. Or I don't like to claim anything like that. But that moment of time at home, uh, I think I was absolutely awful to Kimberly. I, I took a lot out on her because you, you go to training and pretend everything's absolutely fine and you have your teammates and then you go home, but you're in the foulest mood ever. Uh, and I mean, I just, I just try it because I was feeling so awful inside and I was so angry at myself and, and things like that. I blamed things at Bradford maybe if we'd have carried on training through the administration rather than because we found out we weren't insured at Bradford so we all decided well we can't train them because what like one of us goes out and gets injured because they've not paid the insurance bill that then that would affect your opportunity to sign elsewhere. So we, I mean, it's a smart decision that we chose not to train, but I remember thinking, well, if I'd have carried on training, maybe my leg would have been a bit stronger and I'd have never told my ACL when I'd have gone to Lee. And there's all these things that go through your head and you just blame yourself. Because it, it, I mean, you can't blame anybody else, but all that anger that built up inside me, I tried to take out on Kimberly a little bit. Uh, and credit to her for being such a strong-willed woman that she is. She, do, she just took everything. If it, I don't know, she, she'd just go make me a drink and even if I'd shout saying I didn't want orange juice or whatever, she'd, she'd be absolutely fine. She, I, she's never lost a call in however many years I've been with her. She'd just go make another drink and carry on with it. And it's not until we had, we had self-reflection after and we spoke about it that I actually realised how bad I was at the time. And it's a credit to her as a person for kind of sticking up with me and, and cracking on through it. But I mean, that, that's the... As a relationship, I know we're talking about rugby league now, but when you find somebody like that, they help you get through all the highs and all the lows. So they live the highs with you, but more importantly, they can lift you up on the lows as well. And if it, if it wasn't for her, I mean, I, I don't even know where, I, where I'd be personally, uh, as well as just in your entire life, whether or not you've even gone down a completely dark path altogether. Uh, but thankfully, I had her support and I'm forever grateful for that. I mean, during that time, I, I had some great times. I made my radio commentary debut during there with BBC and everything. Obviously, not being able to actually do the games themselves. I mean, I'm still a rugby league nerd. I enjoy watching games. And if I were at home, I'd just be watching them on the TV anyway. And it was James Dayton said, so why don't you just come and do a little bit with me? And they end up paying you to do them. So I'm thinking, well, I'm sat at home watching games anyway. I might as well get paid to talk about rugby league. So I'm only sat talking to Kimberly and she's not listening. So I might as well talk to somebody that is listening to me. It was in that year, even though Lee were doing terrible, I mean, I was back to just being a fan. I didn't have to worry about playing. I didn't have to worry. I would just thought, my season's over. Don't even worry about it. Even though it's nine months, I might make two games at the end of the year if I'm extremely lucky. 
Uh, so just be a fan, just enjoy yourself. And uh, like I said, even though Leeds and Giants themselves were performing badly, I mean, I had a personally an enjoyable year. The fans at Leeds themselves were absolutely phenomenal fans. Even though the team were losing, they were grateful to just be back in the Super League and win, loss or draw, they were, they were enjoying themselves and they sang all the way through the games and everything, which is a, a special group of fans that you don't get at every single club because, I mean, everybody wants you to win, but Lee have been away from Super League for that long. They were just all thankful to be there, which were which were really special in some games and obviously some memorable wins. I remember when Lee beat Wigan at home for the first time in however many years and I remember being at that game and I, looking around at the stadium and how much of a good time everybody was having it. It were a special moment. I mean, I, I was saying I was just lucky if I made the last couple of games. I did work hard, obviously, in the gym because you've got to and you kind of use that as the driving motivation anyway. So I pushed myself as hard as I could and I ended up making the last six or seven games towards the end of the year. I played for Halifax Reserves after six months um, just to get one game and thankful, obviously, to Rich Marshall for giving me the opportunity there just to get out. And I've probably never been as tired in my entire life of playing in a rugby league game. Obviously, you do all these extra weights while you've done a, a lower limb injury, so you put a little bit of weight on and things like that, and you've not been running on the field. So, I think I well, I ended up playing uh, just over the second half, so I played maybe 50, 55 minutes maximum during that game, and it, I felt like I'd been playing four games back to back. Uh, but extremely tired, but I absolutely loved again just being back out there, and the Halifax lads were absolutely phenomenal, like almost like being a kid again. I didn't care whether a coach wanted me to do this or that. I just wanted to get the ball and run at some big idiots as hard as you can and let them big idiots knock the other big idiot running it onto the floor and things. So, I mean, I just I absolutely loved it. And then I got back to training, obviously, at Lee and the team, Matty Dawson and Adam Higson again, that they've been pretty much regularly playing on the wing throughout the entire year. So, I mean, they were at training, but I didn't expect to be playing anytime soon. And it, it was just very lucky for me. Obviously, Adam Higson, he, he was just late one day. He made a little bit of a mistake. I don't actually know whether he slept in or just missed a physio appointment or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, and it, it literally just came the day before a game we were going to play Witness. Neil Dukes just said to me, obviously, Adam, it's an important part of the year. We we're into the middle eights now, but Lee being the bottom four playing against the top four championship needed to win games to survive and stay in Super League. And, as simple as that, Neil Dukes, I didn't have any idea about it whatsoever. I, I was just sat in the meeting, normal, uh, and he says, obviously, Adam higson has been a little bit of an idiot. He's not here today, so James Clay, you're going to get your heritage number at least in Charians, and everybody starts applauding. And it, I mean, that were a, a special moment. I felt like I'd finally got back to where I wanted to be, uh, and I just couldn't wait to play it next day. Uh, and then, obviously, playing against Witness, they ended up winning that game, but I remember scoring a try in that game, which was just nice. I think I was about four weeks in touch. I've seen a picture back after I'd scored it. I've got a foot and a leg in touch, but maybe the referee thought it's his first game back. We'll just give him this one nicely. Uh, but that, that, I mean, that was always nice. I ended up playing every single game towards the end of the year, the Lee Centurions. And I mean, for me, it was just nice to be back out there and, and back playing rugby league. And I probably didn't didn't understand that the team could actually get relegated at that point. I mean, I knew the team could get relegated, but I just thought the team's that good, we're not going to get relegated. I don't need to worry about that. I'm just going to go out there and play and enjoy myself. And the team's going to win because they did it so easily in 2016 uh, to get promoted. I think they ended up, did they win about six or seven out of the seven games? They, they did it so comfortably that I was just thinking, I don't even need to worry about that. I'll just play and I'll enjoy it. I'm going to make no errors and then I'm just going to have a good time. Obviously, we ended up being in a million pound game from losing a couple of games and everything ended up becoming a lot more serious. And I remember playing Catalans in a million pound game. Uh, and I've, I've never seen, I mean, the game went as it did and Catalans were a far better team than Lee on the day. They were just a better kicking game, better fall, better outside backs. So just, they beat Lee St. Charles comfortably on the day. Uh, and I just remember being in a change of rooms and it, it's a strange moment seeing your teammates, but a bunch of 30 odd year old blokes brought to tears in the changing rooms. It was just a weird one because, you, I mean, you look around and to have that much emotion in one room of a, a team that almost felt like, well, they failed the fans had finally got them there after how many years and again, let everybody, everybody down and just really difficult to deal with. And for me though, 
I remember thinking to myself, should I be feeling like they're feeling right now? Obviously, they're all extremely upset and distraught. But I remember thinking I was still signed at Lee Centurions next year. And I thought, well, look, we've been relegated. I'll go back to Championship. It'll be a chance to get some game time back after an ACL injury. I'd only played six or seven games. I just want to have a good year in Championship. I'll enjoy myself. Uh, Lee will get promoted again. Are they going to be in the top four? And then we'll push for it again. And then obviously speaking to Derek Beaumont, he said that the, there was some kind of strange clause in your contract that I'd never even heard of, that it means you could have your contract terminated based on relegation for uh, financial loss or something. I didn't even understand it, I didn't even know it was in there, but apparently it's in every single contract, which, I mean, they have to look after themselves, so that there's no hard feelings about that, but I was just one of the unfortunate ones. I think there was about 10 of us that they chose to let go of at the time. Uh, which is perfectly understandable. I'd only played a handful of games. Some of the other players uh, have been there much longer and but much better servants. And if I were the other player and they chose to keep me on and get rid of them, uh, if I were that player, I'd be thinking, well, he's only played five or six games. He's been out for a full year, let us down a little bit. So, I mean, I, I completely understand the decisions that they have to do to make that. And it, again, similar to the to the Bradford part or the ACL part, you, you're looking around thinking, well, my dream's gone here now. They're, they're going to give me three months' pay is what they chose to do. You're going to get three months' pay uh, and then that's it. Go go to the job centre, find a job and do your best kind of thing. I mean, it, it's really difficult. But And then I remember thinking, oh, yes, in Irish was my agent at the time. And I remember speaking to him and he, he was deadly honest with me. He was just saying, look, we're going to struggle here. You've obviously got no game time really under your belt. You've just come off back of an ACL injury, which it's quite often that you a lot of players re-rupture the same ACL or the second ACL on the other side. And that, that's just, does anybody want to take a risk of somebody that's played a handful of games uh, in a relegated team and could potentially do a second ACL anyway? So it's just one of those things. But thankfully, obviously, Steve Gill and Daryl Powell at Casper Tigers after it. I mean, they had the best 2017 I've, I've ever seen and it, it was nice to watch them obviously as a fan during that year and on the back of such an incredible year, uh, there was an opportunity for me to go back to the club and I ended up taking probably just short of 50% pay cut to go back to Casper Tigers from the wages that I was on at Lee and Bradford. Uh, but it was one of those things that it's not necessarily that I didn't have any other opportunity. I could have pursued other clubs, but whether that it, like my first ever contract, the 50% pay cut from my original, my other deals that was there, uh, I'd have rather, just much rather have been back at Cast under Pauli. Uh, I know he could get the best out of me as a person and as a player. That was the club I wanted to be at, obviously, like we've said before about being a Castleford lad. You know, you almost, even though a club might be interested or a coach, it, it might have been a better decision to go elsewhere or anything like that. You, you focus on what you want to do and you've got that little bit of extra drive to go where you want to go. So I went back and then in 2018, uh, obviously I had to wait a little bit at the start of the season to get an opportunity. Again, I went to Halifax for four games, but uh, just to try and get, obviously get some game time just because Casford was such a good team at the end of 2017 and at the beginning of 2018, they were performing well as well. So it was just kind of waiting for an opportunity to do what you can do almost and I was just, I mean Halifax again such a great club that they give me the opportunity at the end of the ACL give me another opportunity but this time instead of the reserves straight into the first team uh, where we had a couple of players I think Alex Foster was there with me for a little bit as well obviously Will Maher who's at Hulk KR now he was there on the season long loan so it was nice to have a, a couple of other cast lads there with you rather than you just going on your own and I mean I thoroughly enjoyed it there ended up playing three or four games and I mean, I mean, I loved it. There's such a such a good bunch of lads that even though you're, a, I mean, I've been on loan to other clubs before at the beginning of my career, but usually when you're a Super League player and you go on loan to a championship, not all of the lads like you straight away because you might be going in and you only train once or twice in the week and you're expected to play. And there might be another lad there in the same position as you that's done the full pre-season. He's working all day and then training three or four times during the week and you take his spot. Uh, and you, you do feel bad about that a little bit because, I mean, if we could be there the whole time, we could be there. I'd rather be there training with them every single day if you could. But realistically, if, say if we're training Monday all day, because that, that, that's obviously a full-time job, the, the strength and conditioners or the physios are saying, well, you're not training tonight because you, double days are just causing injury, basically. So, I mean, you feel bad, but 
it's just what you've got to do and you've got to remember obviously Darrell Powell's the boss and if he's saying go play at Halifax you, you go play at Halifax and you've just got to kind of take the banter off the lads even though the, the banter they're joking about there's obviously a little bit of serious bit seriousness behind it as well I really enjoyed it and then unfortunately for Greg Eden in 2018 he had a bit of an injury struck season which gave me far more opportunities than I was expecting on such a good Casford team so I was in the team a fair bit in 2018 and Got a good run of games and thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it was just a special year. Obviously, again, you're looking around and there were the league leaders in 2017. So you're looking around that team again, thinking like there's some phenomenal players. There were Man of Steel winners in there, Man of Steel nominees in Luke Gale and, and people like that, and England internationals in Michael Shenton and everything. And I was thinking, just, I mean, how special is this? And I was thinking, I've been at Castles before. Who knows when this is going to get taken away from me again? I'm just going to get my head down and work as hard as I possibly can to keep the shirt for as long as I possibly can. Uh, and then 2018 was just one of those one of those years where, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it as a player, but the team again towards the end, I think we ended up losing to Wigan away in one of the finals, which, I mean, Wigan are such a, such a good team and they play their best rugby league towards the end of the year. And obviously, I mean, other than the 2017 grand final, the team itself didn't have much finals experience and only negative finals experience, whereas Wigan themselves, the, half of their team have been on to win it, win Challenge Cups and everything. So uh, it seems the team's performance, they were just much better than us on the day and we ended up bowing out. But uh, personally, I felt like it was such a good year and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So obviously in 2018, Darrell Powell offered me a contract extension after signing only the one-year deal in 2018. Um, and that, that's just thing from hard earned. Powell made it quite clear to me that it's, it was a one-year deal. And I mean, he had some phenomenal outside backs. You need to be you need to be an eight out of 10 player every single week if you want to earn an extension or if you even want to be in the team because their standards when I was first there, obviously 2012 to 2015, I mean, they were high, but nowhere near as high as they are in 2018 and, and in 2020 now. And just the vibe been raised so much by the team driving for success and more success in the league leaders and a grand final loss that, that that's where they were going next. The Challenge Cup win was a goal, the grand final win was a goal, league leaders win was a goal as well. Uh, so that's one of those things that I just tried to raise my standards as much as possible and obviously must have performed well enough for Pali to offer me an extension on my contract. and. Yeah, that's one of those things. 2019 obviously came along and I'd gone from being just the, the 26 squad number player to a starting shirt at Casper Tigers, which, I mean, that's a, a special memory and a shirt that I'll keep for the rest of my life. Obviously, 2019, it, it ends up being a very similar year to 2018. I, I end up playing every single game by one or two that year. Finished the season as Casper Tigers' top try scorer, which is a, a nice special one for me personally as well. And it, it just when I think we end up losing to Salford in a, I don't know if it's a quarter or a semi-final, it ends up being a, a weird league structure towards the end of the year, but Salford go on to make the grand final anyway, uh, losing against St. Helens. But Salford had such a good run of games towards the end of the year. I, th I think they ended up winning eight or nine games back to back and their fall back were just phenomenal. But it's just one of those things that are like a, a disappointing end to a year because you work so hard and just to get in that top five, which it was, uh, to do to do your very best to give you an opportunity because everybody's thinking about the 2017 success you had and everybody's mentality is we just need to get there and learning the lessons that they learned in the grand final. We're smart and we're ready to go and we can win it this year. It's just getting there that's the difficult part because obviously when you get to the end, there's, there's there's that many defining moments in a game. I remember in the Salford game in 2019, it's Jordan Rankin makes a little bit of a break and it's the Nile levels tackling the corner, uh, forcing Razor into touch. And I mean, that's such a small moment that might happen 10 times in the season and you don't even think about it because then there's just another opportunity later on in the game. Uh, but it's that one moment you think if that were a try, then it completely changes the game uh, on the flip side. So. So you know, those things, obviously, a disappointing end to the year again, but you've just got to dust yourselves off. Uh, and then, obviously, moving into the 2020 season now, the goals are just the same as they were in 2018 and 2019. That, and do you know what? Probably more so now in this year than the previous two years, do I actually believe that these goals are achievable? So, I mean, when I first came in, I was thinking, how am I going to improve this team? In 2018, when we were first looking at it, I'm thinking league leaders. Grand, uh, grand final losers, obviously, but what am I going to do here? How am I going to make these any better? But 
obviously being in the team and, and performing and speaking to Pauli now, you actually do believe the goal that it is achievable. And Casper Tigers as a team, I mean, you live and breathe it for me personally, but we're the team that beat ourselves. Uh, when we go out and perform and do the standards and do what we're asked to asked to do, and I know, nobody ever goes out and doesn't do what they're asked, sorry, but I mean, when you go out and perform the way that you want to perform, I mean, we, we end up winning games, but when little things go wrong or just unnegotiables aren't met is when you end up losing and kind of like that's the same that we're, we're the team that beat ourselves. So it's just one of those things, obviously, we've had the lockdown period now and a chance to refresh and revitalise and, and refocus yourselves because the season started so well for us. We were, we were winning, we're off to a good set of wins at the beginning of the year and lockdown probably came at a bad time because we were on such a nice roll at the beginning. But obviously lockdown's ended now and we've been on a bad roll at the beginning. We, we ended up losing three in a row, uh, just got the fourth win now uh, at the time of recording. I don't know when this is going to go out. Um, but it's one of those things, just getting back on the season so short now and the games are going to be coming thick and fast and it's going to be a full squad effort. It's not going to be a, a 1-13 to 13 or a 1-17 to 17 that's going to win you a league or get you to a grand final or have a challenge cup run. It's literally going to be a, a 1-27, to 27, a 1-30 to 30 effort. So it's one of those things that you're going to need a full squad effort of everybody pulling together and, and giving your best. And it, whether or not it's somebody performing at 80%, but if we can get everybody at 80%, or everybody at 75%, then that collection together will hopefully drive the team to more wins.